All right. Thank you very much. So um, by comparison, can we please turn this down? <laughs> Volume is way too loud for me. Okay. You can turn it down a little more. Yeah. Turn down the volume, please. <laughs> he started down. Okay, good. Perfect. Thank you. So, um, so the two lectures on foams, I, I tried to make pedagogical because uh, it's actually a pretty well-developed subject. By contrast, today, this is really forging off in a totally new direction, and there's not a big body of work to review and to bring people up to speed on. But I'll, I'll, so it'll be more of a seminar, but I'll try to make it as pedagogical as I can. All right. So, um, and uh, it, it helps actually that Andrea has, uh, has, has gone over some of the material. So I'll be reviewing that, and I, I, I won't assume that, that you heard her lecture. Okay. So I'll, I'll try not to make that assumption. So hopefully bring everybody along from the bottom up, as it were. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, good. So um, our task today, my goal today is to help you understand what we're looking at here and how this is a network of variable resistors uh, which uh, uh, can self-adjust, okay, based on only the conditions that they themselves experience in order for this network to learn different kinds of functionalities. Basically, we expose it to training data and it can learn. Okay, all by itself. There's no external memory. There's no external CPU. It does it all by itself. Okay, so um, um, this is what we call bottom-up local learning of function, and uh, I like to tell you how this works and why we're excited about it. All right. So to begin, let's uh, contrast. I mean, what do I mean by bottom-up? Actually, bottom-up is a phrase that maybe is most familiar. With in the context of self-assembly, which is a classic soft matter topic. So um, nature has self-assembled has, has, uh, self from the bottom up structures of all kinds of things, you know, they've evolved for eons, right? And people have clued in that this is a great strategy. If you can, can uh, get structures to self-assemble, then you don't have to go in and put them by hand where you want them. Okay, it just forms itself. So you can form the structure all by itself. Okay, it's not looking at a blueprint and then assembling things. It's just putting things together, shaking, stirring it up, and letting, letting it, letting it, uh, letting it form the structures by itself. Okay, so that's bottom up, uh, uh, or so bottom up, uh, that structure from the bottom up. So by contrast, we're talking about function from the bottom up, and this also is something nature has done. Uh, the first example Andrew talked about is vasculature in the brain, where you have a network. This is a flow network, which is isomorphic to a resistor network, where you change, you know, well, the system changes its, uh, its conductivities uh, based on local conditions in order to redirect blood flow where it's needed. Okay, so that's a great example of bottom-up uh, learning of function. Okay. Um, a much more sophisticated example of that is, of course, the, the neural network in your brain, okay? Your brain is a vast assembly of neurons connected through synapses, and the strength of those synapses and the conductivities along the backbone, of the axon, all this stuff, they vary themselves in order for your brain to learn how to do what it does, okay? And it does it all by itself. There is no external brain that uh, teaches the brain what it's going to do. It just does it from the bottom up. And uh, let's contrast that, this bottom-up approach to learning, with another very famous learning system, uh, an artificial neural network, OK? This doesn't look like uh, the neurons in this neural network, this artificial neural network, don't look at all like actual neurons. What they are are just little edges here. So there's a weight. And what you do is you take all the input values in this input layer, which could represent, for example, uh, pixel values from images. And uh, at this node, you will sum them all up, sum up all the weights, sum up all these inputs with certain weights. Here, we'll sum them all up with different weights, and et cetera. 
And then you do the same thing for the different layers until finally you work it down to some output layer where the goal is to have the output be one, say, for a dog, and this one for be one for a cat, and uh, it'll be zero otherwise, okay? And this system then can learn when you expose it to training data. You take a bunch of pictures of cats and dogs, and you use some of those, a subset of those images to train it, and then you take another subset and test it to see if it works, okay? So um, that's, and, uh, and uh, to do that, uh, there's a there's a tool uh, and uh, called backpropagation, which uh, takes advantage of this layered structure of the network. Basically, you 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 feed forward information. You feed information forward when you do the when you do the you know, the computation. Well, in backpropagation, you go backwards. Okay, also layer by layer, and the idea is what you're trying to do is to minimize a global cost function that penalizes mistakes here. So you define a cost function, and then you do gradient to set in that cost function, and backpropagation is a way of doing that systematically, uh, layer by layer. Uh, but when you do that, you have to have global, well, not global throughout the whole network, but global within the layers, information about the weights of all the neurons in order to adjust an individual neuron. So it's very computationally intensive, okay? You can't adjust one neuron without knowing what all the neurons are doing within uh, that layer, okay? So memory computer power are needed, a vast amount, okay? And it grows rapidly with system size, while well, as, as the, it grows in proportion to system size, okay? So it grows with system size, and um, even when you're done with the training phase and you're in the evaluation phase and want to do the forward computation, it also requires memory and computer power because this is, remember, an artificial neural network that exists in the lab. Okay, um, so that's, that's an artificial neural network. All right. Um, you can also build hardware that will mimic functionality and that can be taught. Uh, so this, is, this, is, this goes under the, the heading of, of, uh, of uh, neuromorphic computing. And the idea there is you're going to build hardware that will mimic an, the neurons in a brain or will, for example, mimic uh, an artificial neural network. You make a hardware version of a neural network. Um, but if you do that, you've got some big problems, actually. Um, they're really susceptible to manufacturing errors. So the people that do these things work super, super, super hard to get around that. Basically, they build in lots and lots of redundancies and uh, half the, you know, things don't work and they got to throw them away. You know, it's really a big problem. It's difficult to scale up hardware to the size that you can actually do anything. If you could, it would be great because then you just, you know, feed in the signals and the signals will, will, count, will, will, will compute uh, very, very quickly. Uh, um, but, uh, but, but it's, it's hard to do that, okay, because it's difficult to scale up. Um, and also I want to emphasize they're not self-trained, right? They might be able to do the forward calculation uh, physically, but they can't do it themselves. To, to train these things, you still have to do backpropagation. It requires an external CPU and memory to train these guys, okay? So, uh, so that's a difficulty. Okay, so that's, that's different, so it's still top-down. Um, besides doing uh, learning in a physical system where you mimic neural or artificial neural networks, you can also try to train certain physical systems to do the forward problem for you for free. So for example, here, uh, Logan Wright, at all at Cornell, published a nice paper where they, they encode information in a wave train. And it could be uh, a sound wave, it could be a, an electromagnetic wave, it could be um, a signal in electronics, okay? And basically you've got some kind of random system with a bunch of knobs that you can tune, and they train this using backpropagation. They train with backpropagation. Which is cool because once it's trained, of course, it'll do the forward calculation for you for free physically, but still requires an external CPU. All right. So I think there are, 
you know, in the field, there's, there's, there's a broad recognition that the top-down approach to learning is really problematic. This is cool, but I think they're actually already about the limits of the size of this and complexity of the systems they can train. And uh, same thing, same thing with these. Okay, so can we do something better? Can we, um, uh, can we somehow make a system that can learn from the bottom up so we can gain some of the, the, the brain E advantages of actual neuron networks in your brain as a learning system? Okay, so we don't have to do anything from the top down. It can all emerge collectively from the bottom up. Can we do that? So if you will, the goal is to try to make something that's closer to a real neuron network than an artificial neural network. And the, uh, uh, the solution that I'm going to tell you about looks kind of schematically like this. We've got some kind of network, and I just drew it as a square grid. And we're going to designate some nodes as input nodes and some nodes as output nodes. And the, the task, if you will, the goal, is for the outputs to be desired function of the inputs. And to make it so by changing the conductivities or resistivities of the edges themselves uh, with some kind of local, local rule where this element will do its adjustment not knowing what any of the other edges are doing. Okay? So that's, that's kind of the goal. And I'll tell it to you in the context of uh, voltages. So this, for me, will be an electrical network of resistors, variable resistors. And we have voltage inputs and voltage outputs. But you could do it with a, um, a microfluidic chip, for example, where you're dealing with pressures and flows. You could do it with mechanical networks, uh, where you're dealing with stresses and strains. Okay. So basically, any kind of network where you've got variable edges, okay, you can, uh, you can, you can, do, you can do this trick. All right, good. So um, here is more what our system looks like, okay? It's going to be more random. The, the input and output nodes are going to be distributed more randomly throughout the system. And uh, so here I just want to say that, that once it's trained, uh, a cool thing about it, like the Logan Wright experiments, is that after it's trained, it calculates the outputs for free just thanks to the physics. Physics will do the forward computation very rapidly and for free. So that's a cool thing. We can only get it to train itself for free. That's, the, that's now the goal. And we're going to use physics also, take advantage of physics in order to do that. OK. And uh, that's where the story begins. And the solution, Andrea told you about, but let me just take you through you again from the, from the bottom, um, is, is, a, is a trick that was invented by, by Naki and Andrea that they call coupled learning. And it's an example of a contrastive learning scheme. So contrastive meaning you take the same network and you subject it to two different sets of boundary conditions and you contrast the behaviors of a sing, you, know, you let an, a single edge contrast its behavior in these two cases and make an update accordingly. And for us, the two cases are going to be the free, what we call free, and what we call clamp. So in the free case, you apply your inputs, and you just read the outputs. You don't mess with them. You just read them and see what you get. If it's untrained, you didn't get the right answer. Okay. So what you can do, though, is you can grab those, and you can apply a nudge to the output nodes. You can nudge them closer to the desired values. So we're going to clamp them. So in this case, literally, we're applying voltages to these nodes. In this case, literally, we're applying voltages to all the nodes. And here, we're just applying the normal inputs. So the inputs are the same in left and right. And here, we're nudging the uh, nodes a little bit closer to what we want. Okay. So we've got two sets of boundary conditions. The so-called learning degrees of freedom, the conductivities of the edges, are the same in both cases. The physical degrees of freedom, namely the, you know, the, in our case, the currents and voltage drops across edges, those are different in the two cases because we're running different boundary conditions. So the physical degrees of freedom are different in here. 
The ones that are computed for free by the physics are different in these two cases, and we want to compare those and figure out how to make our updates. And uh, here is the crucial question that allows us to develop that rule. So this was supposed to fly in, but here it is already. <laughs> uh, so, so what's the answer? Uh, which of these two sets of boundary conditions, under which of these two sets of boundary conditions do you dissipate more energy? Which of these cases requires more power to run? The free or the clamped? And uh, to me, anyway, it's, the answer is not quite so obvious in the electrical context, but it's dead obvious in the mechanical case. So let's say instead of a set of resistors, you have a spring network. And you're going to you're going to you're going to put some forces on input nodes or actually you can apply some strains to input nodes and see what strains you get at the output nodes. Well, if you get the wrong answer at the output nodes, you're going to grab those output nodes and just tug them closer to where you want them to be. So what have you done? You've raised the energy of the system. Obviously, if you let go, it'll spring back. So you store more mechanical energy in the clamp case. In the electrical analog, not quite an analog, but in the electrical case, the corresponding bit of physics is that you will, are obliged to dissipate more, ener dissipate more energy. It requires more power to run this case. You've imposed more boundary conditions. There's more constraints. You're going to dissipate more energy. Okay? So the power okay. here is greater than the power here. That's the crucial bit that's going to make the whole thing go. Doug, I, I have a question. Question. So I agree with your answer, but uh, I disagree with the analogy. Springs are more akin to capacitors. They, they are not going to give you dissipation. You need dashboards in the mechanical case. Well, it's an energy functional. It's energy per time rather than energy. Yes, but if you want to look at the dissipation rate, uh, springs are not going to give you dissipation in the mechanical analog. You no, need dashboards. It's, it's, it, it's, it would be, we'd be talking about the mechanical energy, not dissipation rates for the mechanical case and the capacitor case. In this case, you want to balance the current every, every node? And so balancing the forces on every node in the mechanical case is like minimizing the energy, but balancing the current is like minimizing the power. In either case, there's an energy functional. One is actual energy, the other is energy per time. Okay. And, and you're right. They don't actually map onto each other for the reasons Andrea said. So it's, you know, it's, like I said, it's not really analogous. But it's easier to see the sign of the effect in the mechanical case, for me anyway. All right, so let's take this now and see where we can go. All right, so ordinarily, what you would do in a machine learning uh, process, I said this earlier, is you define some kind of loss function as the desired response minus what you actually get, square it because you don't know which is bigger, and then do gradient descent uh, on all of the learning degrees of freedom to drive this to zero, and then you've learned. So the goal is to drive this to zero using global gradient descent. That's the usual goal. So we're going to define a different kind of loss function. We call it a, a, a contrast function, which will be the difference between the clamped minus the free powers, or in the mechanical case, the, 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 you know, the stored elastic energy in the clamped case minus the stored elastic energy in the free case. Those are intrinsically positive quantities. So I don't need to square it. And I can do gradient descent on this. So this is positive thanks to the physics. So this is where physics enters again. So physics helped us, is going to help us do the forward problem. This little bit of physics, namely this positive, is going to help us do the, the backwards problem um, for learning. And here is how that works. So there's gradient descent. Kj is the conductivity of edge J. This is how it changes with time. It'll go downhill, so there's a gradient, minus sign, of the, of the contrast function. And if you implement this, this time derivative to update edge J, okay, you will drive this global cost function to zero, and that's the goal. All right, uh, and, and, as, I, I, and as, I, as I did say, this is a global cost function, so let's just write it out. 
the power in the clamp case is just sum of V squared over resistivity, and the free case is V squared over the same resistivity. But the voltage drops across edge I are different in the free and clamp cases. Okay? So I guess I, we should have used superscripts or something when I, when I wrote this out. So these VIs are different. The KIs are the same. Okay? So say it differently. The, the learning degrees of freedom, the KIs are the same. But the, the physical degrees of freedom, the voltage drop across edge J, again, again across edge I, is different in the clamp and free cases because they're running different boundary conditions. All right, so we, and it's global because we have to sum over all the edges. That's what the sum over I represents. But we're only interested in updating, at the moment, edge J. So, so look at this. Since I don't have to square it, I can, I can move this derivative through here. And what does it do? It picks out only edge J. All edges I, they're not equal to J. The derivative is zero. Only edge J survives. And there's what we get. It's a very simple derivative. Okay? And you could do the same trick with any kind of physical cost function, right? If you do the mechanical case or if you do it with currents, uh, you'll have a slightly different uh, energy functional, but it'll still be clamp minus free. And depending on what learning degree of freedom, for example, edge links or, or spring constants for your network uh, would go into this, this thing. But you can do the same exact thing, and you will develop a rule just like this. Since we don't have to square it, there are no cross terms. And the update of edge j is purely dependent on the voltage across edge j in the two different cases. So it's a local rule, totally local. So absolutely magic. To me, right? We're going to use this local rule to minimize a global contrast function. And when we do that, we will achieve the desired response equal to the free response. That's the idea. All right. Good. Uh, let's contrast that with, a, um, with, with, with some other learning local learning rules. So let me, let me go back a, a, a bit. So, um, sorry, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be going, I should know not to go backwards because this thing responds so slowly. It's, it's always a bugaboo. Go, please. So I said it here, but I, on my slide, but I didn't mention it. So, um, um, there's another contrastive uh, scheme that was proposed um, by uh, uh, Benjamin Stelier and, uh, and Yashua Bengio. They call equilibrium propagation. So let's just contrast these two things real quickly. I'm sorry about this. I can't drive this car. <laughs> There we go. So the difference is in the nudge. Okay, so the idea of equilibrium propagation is to do the clamping by running a current. Okay, whereas we do it, we do the nudge in terms of the voltages. Okay, so, so it's different. So they're still trying to do voltage in, voltage out, but you do your nudge by running in a current proportional to the difference in the the desired and free cases, and we do it based on, uh, sorry for the switch notation, uh, by D, I, I really mean clamped, okay? Uh, sorry, no, sorry, no, 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 I don't mean that. Uh, yeah, the, the, the clamping is, is done based on, yeah, the difference between desired and free, okay? So it's a voltage versus, uh, versus uh, 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 current thing. All right, uh, but these guys haven't actually built it, and, uh, and we have. I don't know how to do this one in the lab. Also, I can't understand their paper. All right, so here's some other learning rules we can contrast it with. So again, here's a couple learning rule for the uh, updating conductivities. And Andrea mentioned another uh, local learning rule that she's worked with, uh, with Sid Nagel and Nini Pashin, which is directed aging. And uh, just to look at it directly and compare and contrast, the 
the directed aging rule is just to update the edge J based on minimizing the clamp power. So it's not the difference, you're, it's not a cost function, you're just trying to drive the clamp power to zero. Or in the mechanical case, minimize the mechanical energy, which is what their, their spring networks did. So, so this works, you, could, you, can, you, can, you can do some things like the, the Poisson ratio, but you can't teach it fine scale tasks, okay? You know, complex input-output relations, this can't handle because this isn't the, it isn't related to the, you know, the, the loss function, okay? So this doesn't work as well. Another one I'll come back to later is to, to take advantage of this uh, couple learning scheme, generalize a little bit to minimize power dissipation. So we could add in a small amount of free power here and treat this as bar local rule. And if we do that, and if epsilon is small, we'll minimize both, we'll, we'll strike a nice happy medium between, and we'll, just, we'll, we'll, we'll learn our, our task, and we'll also minimize the cost it takes to run the circuitry. So that's a cool thing that we can, we can do. All right, so how does it work? So here is the first actual implementation of couple learning by, by Naki, which is done in silico, and it's for classifying handwritten digits, zeros and ones, the so-called MNIST, the subset, the MNIST data set, which goes from zero to nine, okay? And uh, what they did is they designated uh, some nodes, the red ones, as inputs, so they took, uh, they did a PCA analysis of these things and fed in the components as, 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 uh, as uh, voltages in the, uh, the red nodes, and then they wanted to read the outputs, whether it's zero or one, based on the values they saw at these, these two nodes. Okay. And the idea is that if you feed in a zero, you want this one to light up more strongly than if you feed in data for a one, you want this one to light up. And, uh, and it worked. And uh, the, uh, the networks here are colored after it's been trained. So uh, it was started maybe with sort of random connectivities, and now they're shaded according to the actual conductivities in the learned case. So, so you can see what happened. They sort of you know, dropped out some of the edges around this guy so these two guys aren't so connected and so forth over here. And otherwise, it's sort of hard to see what's going on. And uh, these, uh, these are colored according to the power that's being dissipated in the, in the, in the two cases. All right, so, so it worked. And super, super promising. Um, I didn't quite catch the question. Okay, so the question was, how do we input the data, basically? How do we feed these images in here? So you can see there's lots of pixels, and if we had a big enough network, we could feed each pixel value into a separate node. But the networks aren't big enough, so what they did instead is they did a, a principal component analysis, and they talk, took the top 25. So there's 25 input nodes. Actually, that's overkill. I, I'm not sure, maybe Andrew, you know the number offhand. You need a small number, like five to 10, maybe less. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. This was done with a PCA analysis, and actually you don't need very many PCA components, because it's such a simple thing to tell a zero from a one. So this is a bit of a cheat, but, um, more recently, Sam has taken the, the new circuits and has trained downsampled images. So the MNIST data set, it's 28 by 28 pixels, but you can downsample it to like five by five pixels. Okay, then he was able to feed that in, or maybe it was even three by three. I think he downsampled to three by three. It was three, three by three. three. Yeah, three by three, which is enough to tell the difference between zero, one, two, and three, okay? And, and then he was able to feed in those dance sampled images as inputs. So each pixel then is an input. Yeah, I don't have that example. That, yeah. that, 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 that's not published yet. I don't have it in the slides. Yet. But, but just it, to but say it again, uh, converted these images into three by threes. So there's nine inputs. And just fed, converted the grayscale values to a voltage and, and plugged them in. Any other questions? Sure. Yeah, so I mean, here the 
the options are only two, right? It's not as though it could be anything else. And in some sense, your machine, such as it is, knows that because it's only being asked to choose these two, right? In that sense, 25 or even 9 or 10 seems like a lot of information to give about the object. Am I? In, in Sam's case, and again, yeah. I'm sorry, I don't have it's yeah. published, so we don't have you know nice figures and things to show on this yet. But it was actually digits zero one, zero one, two, and three. Yeah. Okay. So, that's, so it was a bigger, it was right, a bigger right, task. Right. Okay. Uh, but you're, you know, you're, you're you're touching on, you're both touching on with your questions on really important issues that have yet to be fully grappled with, namely, how do you input the data? How do you program these things? And what's the capacity of a system to learn? What's the learning capacity of a given network? Those are really important questions that we are going to struggle with for a while, I think. So there's lots to do in this. We've got basically many more questions that we have answers at this point. It's in the early stages of the game. <laughs> All right, so now uh, it's great that you can do this in silico, but we want to take advantage of physics to do the forward problem by building this in the laboratory. And uh, you know, uh, so we want to get away from having to use a computer to do the forward problem, right? It's very onerous, Andrea said, to sor solve Kirchhoff's laws. Or if you have a, uh, a large network of nonlinear circuit elements, it's very onerous to do this. While as the physics, as soon as you apply the voltages, the currents spring up very, very quickly, and you can just read out the answers, right? So letting physics do the calculation for you is a huge advantage once you have big and nonlinear systems. And we want to be able to take advantage of that. So we got to build this in the lab. How are we going to do that? OK, how are we going to do that? And uh, the first one we did is based on digital variable resistors that you can just buy. These are little, little devices like this that can plug into a breadboard. And if you give a voltage pulse to a certain pin, the resistance will go up by one notch. If you give it to another pin, it'll go down by one notch. And there are 128 resistance values. Uh, sometimes these seasons are called digipots. Okay. So um, it's easy to get your hands on those, and you can make up a network. But it would be pretty silly to, to build it and then come along with a little voltmeter and read voltages across the edges, or even instrument it up, write it down, and then compute it offline and use that to do your updates. Right? That would be kind of silly. And it's a tricky problem. Right? How are you going to do the updates? How are you going to implement the couple learning rule without memory or a central processor? Okay? And here's the trick we came up with, is to build identical twins. So we're going to have two. Uh, remember, we've got free in the clamp boundary conditions. We're going to build one circuit that's dedicated to the free case. And we're going to build a second circuit that's dedicated to the clamp case. And we're going to make them twins in the sense that their resistances are always the same. They're as identical as we can make them in the laboratory. The only difference is, is their boundary conditions, okay? Which, you know, which, 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 uh, which voltages are being given uh, to which nodes, okay? So here's what one edge looks like, okay? So here's one self-adjusting edge. Here's the digipot and the freak case. Here's the digipot and the clamp case. And then there's some circuitry on board that will compare the voltage drops across these two resistors. And every clock cycle, decide whether you want to move these up or down by one notch. Yeah, let me just bring that in. So there's the actual couple learning rule translated from connectivity into res resistivities. Okay, so every clock cycle will update edge R according to this if we could. Uh, but first time out of the box, we did something simpler. We just decide, we just figured out the circuit decides if this is po this quantity is positive or negative, and we go up or down by one notch. Okay. So it'll get us where we want to go, but it's not as fast as gradient descent. But it will get us to where we want to go. How do we know? Well, because we built it <laughs> and tested it, and, uh, and it works. So I don't think we want to talk about. Uh, uh, circuitry here, uh, but one one simple one uh, 
test case to look at just to sort of see that things are doing what they should be doing is a so-called voltage divider. So the idea is we're going to put 5 volts here and 0 volts here, and we want to get a desired voltage at the target in between by adjusting the resistances of, uh, of uh, these two resistors, A and B. Okay, so that's the idea. So here's what it should look like, and here in practice, what, what you know, we got one edge here and one edge here, so you can see the twins. Okay, so those are the twins. And uh, they're running different boundary conditions, because one is free and this one is clamped. Okay. Uh, this one is cool, too, because we know the answer. Right? So the, uh, the resistance ratio is given by the desired voltage ratio minus one. Okay, so that's just easy to solve. So we know the answer, and uh, we can see uh, that works. All right, so let's just look at work, walk our way through this plot. So this is the output voltage versus training steps. And you can see there's, there's uh, one, two, three, four regions. And in those four regions, we actually trained for four different tasks. First, we wanted it to be 3.75 volts. Then we want it to be 2.5 volts, then 1 volt, then 2.5 volts. And you can see at the beginning of this interval, we had the wrong voltage on the free case as well as the clamp case. Well, and we, we nudged, we nudged, we, we nudged the clamp case from where it was closer towards where we want it to be. So the nudge factor was close to one half. Actually, I think it is one half. Yeah, so the nudge factor is one half. We nudged it halfway to where we want it to be. And you can see the free case evolved using a couple learning rule to the desired value. And this one evolved to the desired value. Evolved to the desired value. Evolved to the desired value. So it worked. We can look at the resistances and see if they're doing what they should be doing. And here's what. They do. So um, first look at this curve down here. So this is the resistance ratio, this blue curve down here. So the resistance ratio started wrong, and I went to the right value. Started wrong, went to the right value. Started wrong, went to the right value. Started wrong, went to the right value. So the resistance ratio went to the value we knew it had to. So this was a good check, it made us all happy. Um, but if you look at the actual resistances, once it learned, actually it drifted. The resistances drift. This is not, there's not just one answer. To get the desired output voltage, all it takes is getting the right ratio of resistances. It's only the ratio that matters. The values themselves can be different. There's more degrees of freedom in the system than you need. Right? It's underdetermined. So once I found a solution, it was free to drift, and actually there's a little bit of drift in the circuitry that lets these move to higher resistances, and it'll go up until it reaches the rail, 128. Okay? So it always goes up, reaches the rail, and then it stops. The digipods change their resistances in multiples of delta R. Correct. Then why is the drift? not showing me jumps, why is it continuous? If Especially for our survey. If you were survey. to zoom in, you would see little, 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 little jumps. Yeah, they're there. All right, so there's a voltage divider. And that's, that's a, so this is just a baby case, just to, you know, uh, I, I, I think help talk you through, again, the way it all works. And now we, of course, want to build a network. And there's Sam, a uh, great postdoc who made it all happen. And here is his learning network. Okay, so I showed you a zoom in before of one edge. And here we have 16 of those edges. So Sam built 16 edges and he tested them all with voltage dividers. And then he hooked them up into this random network that's shown here, where you can see uh, superposed in blue the edges and the nodes more easily than you could if you just looked and see what's on our optical table. <laughs> So there it is. Uh, so we've wired it up so those 16 edges had nine nodes. So we've got nine nodes that we can use for input, inputs and outputs. 
and uh, the first thing he did was, was, was one of these Allostery-like tasks, like the voltage divider, where you apply certain, in, certain uh, inputs. Okay, now there's three inputs. One, two, three. And I don't remember which is zero, one, and five volts, but the red are the input voltages. And the idea is that when you have those at these, uh, these values, you want these open purple ones to be at uh, three volts. And you want to get there by adjusting the resistors in the network to do that. So that's, that's an allostery task. And there's four curves here. Uh, one is the, the, the uh, three of them are their mean squared errors between uh, the output nodes and three volts. And the other is the sum of those, that's the black. And you can see that they all go down to the noise floor of the experiment after about, you know, on the order of 50 training steps. So that worked. Uh, yeah, so it, there, there is still drift in the system. But I, I think that it's sort of drifting around more, well, the drift is not helping you find better solutions in this case. Um, and eventually it's going to a rail. Okay. And so eventually, right, so a lot of this, a lot of this, this noise is the system drifting. And if you did it even longer, it would hit a true noise floor where a bunch of the resistors are pegged at the rail. And then it was truly just noise in the circuitry. Does the better connectivity decreases the error? I'm sorry. Like the does the better connectivity of the like input nodes to like uh, several nodes, other nodes, uh, does it decrease the error with like training steps? I didn't quite understand still. Because uh, like one of the input node has like three connections and one of them have like uh, five connections. Like, if you increase the connectivity to, like, other nodes, uh, does it decrease the error uh, in the output? Oh, okay. So, I understand. So, um, we've got 16 edges. We could have hooked it up in a different circuit. There's a lot of networks we could have made. Even with this one, and I'll show you some plots of this, there are different ways to choose the input-output nodes. And in all cases, we, so this is very, so of course Sam did that, and uh, this is the sort of data that he sees in all cases. It looks like this very generically, okay? So, so is there a way to optimize that? The way you do it, does it, does it, uh, does it, does it affect the ultimate learning capacity of the network? For sure. Do we know how? No. <laughs> no one know, no one knows how to do that yet. This is still the wild west. Okay, so lots of good open questions here. I know. Uh, yeah. So here are these learning degrees of freedom at the edges, or maybe the variable register on these edges, right? So making a big circuit, it is necessary that there should need much more variable resistance. So to implement in the real circuit, so is there any way we can boil down it? small number of registers so that we can get the desired properties. Um, so um, if I understood the question right, can you, can you build a bigger network with some edges that are not variable? And you can do that. You can certainly do that. Um, the idea is, though, I think the, 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 the sort of lore from the really the, um, the machine learning community is you want to be in the over-parameterized regime where you've got many more learning degrees of freedom than you have constraints so that there are lots of solutions. So as long as you've got enough degrees of freedom to work with, you can have some dead degrees of freedom, if you will, and, and it doesn't affect the behavior. It doesn't affect the ability to learn. In fact, if some of these edges stop functioning, exactly that happens, and Sam doesn't even know. I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. So yeah, you can make some dumb edges, and it still works just fine. 
All right, so Alice Derry is kind of like uh, the voltage divider. This is, a, this is a fancy version of a voltage divider. Uh, here's something a little more complex is to learn regression, linear regression. We want, the, we want two output nodes, these, again, these open purple ones, to be, to be a linear combination of two input nodes. And I call it three because one of them is ground. So, so what you do is you construct a training set based on multiple, value, multiple V1, V2 pairs, and uh, you calculate the, you know, you, 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 know, you construct the data set uh, and uh, you, you flash it to, the, uh, to the, the case, and then you just uh, uh, let it evolve, and, uh, and then look at the mean squared error for some training data, and uh, here's what we see. Okay, so for the two, the, uh, uh, it's actually kind of hard to see. There's two purple data sets here, and again, the black is the mean squared error. It's a log scale, so, so one of the purple, one is pretty close to the money. Uh, just by chance, the other is quite wrong. And eventually, there you go. You learn the regression task. So there you go. There's a more complicated task. Um, you can do classification. This is the example that Andrea, the one example Andrea showed. So here we have uh, photographs of iris flowers. Okay. And someone came along and measured four numbers for each photograph. And they did that for 50 flowers for three different species of iris. So that's the data set. Four measurements for 50 flowers for three species. And the idea, of course, is then to classify. Once you have those numbers, can you tell which species of flower you're looking at? So since we've got four input, four, four measurements, we'll have four input nodes plus a ground. Those are the red. And since we have three species, we'll have three output nodes or targets. And uh, this is not like an artificial neural network. You can't just make this be one and these be zeros when it's a species A, this one and these zero when it's species B, this one and these zero when it's species C. That doesn't work. What you do instead is you make it be the, the mean squared difference between the output values and uh, the average of all of the the things in the data sets, the L2 norm would be the, uh, the outputs from the average input for each species. And uh, every epoch, you update what you think is the, the average input. Um, basically, you're, you're redefining what, what, is the, what, is the, uh, what, what is the goal uh, each epoch. And uh, there you go, it learns. And uh, it learns about 95% accuracy, which is really as good as you can do with the linear classifier with this data set. So this is the most sophisticated example here with, with this linear network. All right, good. So we're very excited about this. Um, it seems to work. It learns all by itself. And uh, here are some, some cool things about it. So it's flexible and retrainable. And again, I think Andrea class showed you this. So you do classification, but you can immediately switch and do Alistairi. And here you can see uh, there are different choices for the input output nodes, and it learns just fine. So you can do, go from classification to allosteri uh, to regression, okay? And uh, it works just fine. So that's cool. Very, very flexible system. Um, it's robust to damage. So the, I, I mentioned before that a, 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 a disadvantage of neuromorphic hardware and, and it's the same disadvantage as you get for actual computers, is that they're very susceptible to little bits of hardware damage. So this is pretty extreme, you know, sawing into an iPhone, okay? Uh, but if you, if, you, uh, if you remove half of a brain, this brain still has a lot of functionality. It can't do everything it did before, but it can still do a heck of a lot. So these are really, really robust to damage, okay? And our, where, so, so you can ask, where are our circuits? Where do they lie in the spectrum between computers being super fragile and brains being super robust? Where do our circuits lie? And the answer is, they, uh, we can figure that out just by progressively snipping edges and seeing what happens. Okay. 
gave up on that. <laughs> and uh, let's see if I can figure out where to stand so I can see the, see the screen. Um, um, you snip an edge, you have to retrain, but you can retrain. Snip an edge, you got to retrain, but you can do it. Snip an edge, uh, not nearly as much damage, you retrain. Snip an edge, oh look, no damage, and et cetera. So it's very robust to damage. You can degrade it, but it can still learn, it can still do its thing. And in fact, Sam, um, this is not a representative data set. This is not what you get by selecting edges at random. If you select edges at random, this case occurs more than the others where you snip it and absolutely nothing happens. So that's super cool. And this feature made it very difficult actually for Sam to debug the networks and figure out what's going on because some edges would not be functioning and it would train up just fine and he wouldn't know it. And he'd look at resistance values and scratch his head and figure out what, what's going on. The behavior is not quite right, yet it's training. What's going on? And it's because it trained around it. It trained around it. So that's very cool. And uh, for us, that's very important uh, because it's going to make it manufacturable. And I'll have more to say about that later. Um, probably a silly question. Um, can you assign it multiple tasks? So will any set of inputs given at one time be treated as one large input? We've done some of that. Mm. And the answer is it depends on how you show up the data. Mm -hmm. So if you slowly train one task and slowly train the other, or do it slowly back and forth, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But if you flash the two data sets simultaneously, fast on the time scale which you're updating the learning degrees of freedom, mm -hmm. then you can do it. Huh. Let's see. Yeah. All right, so here's some other features. Um, we can, uh, so let, let's, let's think about comparing and contrasting our networks with uh, neural networks in the brain, real neural networks. So um, our circuit is on a clock, right? But our brain is not really on a clock. Neurons are not up, updating on a clock. So can we get rid of the clock? And with this digital case, not really, but what we can do and this is done by an undergraduate student, uh, Jacob Wyckoff, is update only a fraction of the edges at a time. And that's what the flashy blinky lights are from the movie on the first slide. So we're only updating a fraction of the edges on a, on a, on a given clock cycle. And I'm going to ask, can it learn in that case? And the answer is yes, it can learn. So there's a mean squared error. It goes down. And it's shown here for three different cases where the fraction being updated is one, down to the fraction being updated being only, you know, 5%, okay? So it learns. And a cool thing is if you look carefully, the noise floor is different for these three cases. So the residual mean squared error after training goes down if we make it more and more desynchronous. And this is actually kind of like the idea of stochastic gradient descent, where in artificial neural networks, it's a trick where you only update a batch of the edges at a time. And that gives you a little bit of momentum that'll help you get out of local minima and help find a, uh, a solution. And uh, Naki has is, is got some nice arguments to sort of map this onto stochastic gradient descent. So that's a cool feature, doing it asynchronously. Another Another contrast between our first network and, uh, and brains is that our physical degrees of freedom are always in equilibrium and they equilibrate very, very fast compared to how fast we're changing the, uh, well, the clock, okay? Uh, but in the brain, that's not really the case. The brain is evolving on the same time scale as it's learning, okay? So, so basically we're asking something about rates and learning out of equilibrium. Can we learn faster, okay? And we're showing it data. And uh, so here is, here is the answer. Well, uh, here's simulation that Naki did. So the mean squared error as a function of learning rate divided by equilibration rate. His noise floor in the simulation is really small, 10 to minus 19. But if you start trying to learn too fast, the, the noise goes up. I'm sorry, the, 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 the trained error goes up. But it didn't get too big. Look at that, 10 to the minus 7. 
and it actually went down again. Sort of worse right here, the peak of the trend. Sam can't do much about um, 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 slow, well, uh, he can't really, really flash data at any faster than he's doing it already, but he can slow it down by putting in these big old capacitors across the resistors. And the same thing we see, uh, same thing uh, that Naki saw, Sam saw in the lab. Uh, for slow enough learning, it works. Even if you learn out of equilibrium, you just get a little bit of mean squared error that's bigger. Okay, so you, if you want to learn fast, you can't learn as well, but you can still learn. And that's pretty remarkable. So that's a cool thing. All right, and then here's the power optimization case. So as I mentioned, we can add in a little bit of uh, epsilon of, of free power to the cost function, the contrast function, go downhill using couple learning, and uh, indeed, um, there's a trade-off. So as you can see here, as the, uh, as the power goes down, the error goes up, right? So, so in other words, we're working our way left. So here, we consumed more power, but the error was small, so we're gonna increase epsilon. So we'll lower the free power, and we go up then in error. So here is in the, in the, uh, in the uh, simulation, there is in the lab, and uh, we're working on a paper now on that. All right, so there's another variation, another feature. Very cool. All right, so now let's see if we can take advantage of the, um, the um, more sophisticated uh, electronics that you can get your hands on to do this in a different way. So let's redesign our circuit uh, to, to work with analog electronics, namely transistors, basically still off-the-shelf components that you can buy, but that once you got your design right, you could put on a chip. So you can make huge networks and make it run really fast. So um, here's our version of doing that. So our learning degree of freedom will essentially be the, the, the charge on a capacitor that controls a gate voltage, lets through different amounts of current. So this is a way of effectively controlling the resistance of the edge. And uh, here's an example of what an edge looks like. It's complicated, I don't wanna go into it. I barely understand it myself. It involves something called a Gilbert cell, which actually uh, implements the, the, the full coupled lear learning rule exactly, not, this, not an approximation. And to do this, we teamed up with Mark Miskin, who is an electrical engineer and is expert in, in these things. So, but Sam still is the guy with the boots on the ground, and he made it all work, and here's sort of an earlier version of it. And uh, let's see what that can do. What can it do? Well, it can do more, as I'll show you, and it can do more because the IV characteristics are not ohmic. It's a little bit nonlinear. So low gate voltages, okay, low gate voltages where the resistance is high, the resistance depends on the voltage at each edge, each end of the, of the device, you know, the input and output, uh, you know, the two ends of the thing. So the, the resistance is not constant. At high gate voltage, when you have low resistance, it's easy for stuff to flow through, the resistance is small and constant. So it becomes nonlinear. So this thing has nonlinearity. And because of the nonlinearity, maybe you can have more functionality. So I didn't talk about it, but with artificial neural networks, it's really important to have nonlinearities in the way you add up the, 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 uh, the way you propagate information forward. So basically your weights can be positive or negative. You add them all up, you could have a positive or negative number, but then you chop off the negative values. It's called a ReLU function in the, in the business. So you impose a nonlinearity, and that's super important for getting those things to have functionality. So having nonlinearity is important. It lets you do more things. For example, maybe we can calculate the XOR function. We couldn't do it before because, well, the truth table, assigning these, these zeros and ones and voltages, for example, uh, the inputs, you know, the, the, the answer is not a linear combination. The outputs are not a linear combination of the inputs. 
It's not like doing the, the regression tests. You just can't do this with the linear case. Maybe we can do it now. And indeed you can. Indeed you can. So this should be a movie. Cursor. Oh no, I've got a cursor on the screen. Okay, it's playing. Good. So there's a movie. So we're showing the, the conditions of the circuit under four cases. You know, true, true, false, 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 true, uh, false, true, true, false. Okay, and uh, input one is is supplied as the voltage difference between these nodes. So Going up, it's one. Going up, it's zero or false, and et cetera, for the other input. And then we'll read whether or not it's true or false based on the size of the voltage drop going upwards between these two nodes. So we would like a large, in one case, and, and, a, and, a, and, a, uh, and, a, and a zero in the, in, in the other case for a false. Okay, so this looks like a false, this looks like a false. And these two look like a true. Okay, so it learned it. And if you look carefully, um, you'll see that the gray, the edges are colored gray with different widths. And those widths represent the conductivities of those edges. We're running different boundary conditions, so there are different currents flowing. So the re the conductivity, the edge, is going to be different in the different cases if it's nonlinear. This edge is thicker than it is here. This is a higher conductivity, this is a lower conductivity. So that you can see is a nonlinear response. The circuit had to figure out where in phase space was the nonlinearities and take advantage of those nonlinearities in order to calculate the XOR function. I could never figure out in my head how to tell it to do that. It figured it out. <laughs> so that was pretty smart. And it worked. So that's Super cool. Um, here's another example of a a a, class, a a a task that you could never do with a linear system, uh, nonlinear classification. So now we're going to have two inputs, source one and source two, and here's a scatter plot showing the training. Each point represents a point in the in the in the in the training data set. Sorry, the test data set. And uh, the idea is we want to distinguish combinations of source one and source two that lie inside this elliptical region versus outside the elliptical region. And the goal is for it to look like this. So we color them darker or lighter based on whether the classification was incorrect or correct. And you can see in this case the decision boundary is sort of this diagonal line. So these guys are incorrect. These guys are incorrect. And with time goes on, more and more become correct. The decision boundary kind of moved off until a train. Okay. So nonlinear classification, it worked. It figured out how, figured out how to do that. Um, here's a spiffy movie that Sam just made. If I can get it to play. Um, where you through all these things, get it to show the movie, so you can see the decision boundary moving around in real time <clears throat> until it ended up being what he was training for, which was something along here. Okay. So very nonlinear task, and it worked. All right, so let me bring it all home. And summarize, so this, this twin network system that, that, uh, that Sam built uh, based on the, the couple learning rule of Naki and Andrea um, is actually, I believe, the first laboratory realization of an autonomously learning, self-learning system, a system that can learn by itself. It's the very first example of bottom-up learning of functionality that's been artificially made. And um, the way it works is uh, double gradient descent. Physics does 
very quickly, grain descent on the physical degrees of freedom. So the currents and voltages uh, equilibrate very quickly. Okay. Uh, we don't have to think about how nature does that. It just does it very quickly for us. And with a couple learning rule, we do gradient descent effectively on a, cost, a global cost function based on a local rule. So physics has come into, into play two ways, one in doing this gradient descent and one in enabling the couple learning rule. So physics, if you will, solves a global problem, uh, equilibrating those physical degrees of freedom very, very quickly. And circuitry, implementing the couple learning rule, solves the, the other gradient descent problem uh, very, very quickly. Uh, in principle also. All right. So we demonstrated a bunch of different tasks. Uh, you know, so the voltage divider and more complicated allosteric tasks with regression, uh, linear and nonlinear classification in XOR uh, with our other versions. And there's lots of interesting variations to think about that help us build our intuition about how these things work and what they can do and what the limitations are and how to program them and construct them and so forth. So that's cool. And uh, the outlook is that these things are actually massively scalable. So like the brain, okay, the computation is distributed across the whole network. These things are super recurrent. It's not like the layered scheme of a uh, artificial neural network. Everything is connected to everything. And I think that's what helps make it be super robust. You can't destroy, if you destroy one element, you haven't destroyed the, the whole network. No edge is like a bottleneck. Uh, and that, that makes it super, super robust. Okay. So um, global information or processes are not needed, of course. And uh, since it is robust, it should be manufacturable. We ought to be able to make large versions of these things. All right. And um, oh my gosh, I don't even have a picture in, my, in these slides. So I, I messed up. Um, we've actually got breadboards now that implement the analog case. So breadboards are coming in and being tested now as we speak. So the idea is we're going to make breadboard versions of these. In the lab, when you, when you wire these things up by hand, Sam has been a hero making like, you know, 25, 30 edges. That's super, super hard already. Okay, once we make them with breadboards, we'll be able to make maybe 100 or 200 uh, edge networks. And we'll see how those go. Uh, printed circuit, yeah, God, I'm, I'm losing my, losing the ability to speak. It's printed circuit boards. Printed circuit boards. Printed circuit boards we've got and are now testing. Okay, and with those printed circuit boards, we'll be able to make networks of like, you know, two or three hundred edges. Okay, and, uh, and we got lots and lots and lots of, uh, open questions and new directions to think about. And uh, let me just stop there and acknowledge the folks who, who did the hard work and, uh, and so much of the inspiration. And uh, so Sam, who built all the circuits, and, well, actually Jacob and Ben are building some things under Sam's supervision. And uh, Lauren is joining the, the, the program. So she's testing the printed circuit boards and she's actually making mechanical versions. Now also, and there's Naki and Andrea uh, in the theory, and Mark Miskin, our great colleague in electrical engineering, who, um, who basically designed the, uh, you know, the, the Gilbert cells to do this. All right, with that, let me thank you for your questions. We'll stop right there and see if I can answer any more questions. When you were cutting those uh, connectivities and you were trying to retrain the system, you found that almost it was not affecting anything. Now, there must be a critical number of them that you can finally cut and still retrain the system. Yep. Um, is, is there some, like, can you? Basically, as long as you've got more learning degrees of freedom than constraints, you can retrain it. Right. So it's a constraint satisfaction problem. So, so ideally, you need very little, like, kind of information that you were requiring doesn't need so many connectivities. Yeah. So that will help in building bigger, uh, like, you know, when you, you kind of 
you want to expand the system and give an estimate of how much connectivity you would need for that's right. I, I think that's an important issue is how underdetermined, how under constrained does it need to be? You know, if you make it too under constrained, if you make the networks too big, you've just wasted effort and you're going to dissipate too much power. But if you make it too small, it's not going to find good solutions. So there's some optimum in between. And uh, I have a hard time reading the machine learning literature, but I think artificial neural network people know a lot about this, but it's hard to figure it out, okay, where they live on this. Um, there's, a, there's also a phenomenon known as double descent, where actually um, as, you, as, you, uh, as, as you go from underparameterized to overparameterized, when you're just a constraint satisfaction, you do the worst in terms of in terms of mean squared error. And if you, if you and as you go above that, actually with a little bit of regularization, you do you do a great job again. Okay, so the transition. Yes. Yes, and we're actually so Jacob has been working on double descent in the context of the simulations and building the networks. And we've seen some of that. So we're exploring these issues. Um, so, Doc. Um, so, <laughs> take a number. <laughs> uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. So, uh, so. As you cut the edges, the system can still learn. So uh, you need actually uh, less number of uh, learning degrees of freedom actually to learn something accurately uh, up to some optimal number. That's right. That was yeah. a sign that we had extra learning degrees of freedom. Right, exactly. So I was wondering like what is the advantage having extra learning of uh, learning degrees of freedom? Is it like, uh, does it help learn it uh, faster? Uh, with nonlinear, it helps you get out of local minima. It helps you find a, a better solution faster. Faster also. Yeah. Okay. It also helps you learn more complicated problems. Huh. The bigger, right? Just think about C. elegans has like mm -hmm. 300 neurons. We have about 10 to the 8 neurons. That, that difference helps us learn a lot more. Or ChatGPT has a trillion parameters. I think mm -hmm. ResNet has like 10 million or something, right? That, that yeah. increases what allows that, the, what you learn to become more and more complex. Yes, yeah, thanks. That uh, uh, now you can make like a bigger circuit uh, with many nodes. So uh, in that case, uh, having some sort of clusterings in the how the how the networks is structured, w will that be helpful? Uh, as in, like it might bring up like uh, nonlinearities and. Uh, That's a great question. So how do we program these things? How should we select the input and output nodes? What architecture should we make? Um, what connectivity, you know, connectivities of in each edge, you know, in the square lattice, there's just four edges per node. Should we have more, right? Should we have, should we make it, should we make some long range connections so it's hierarchical, like in the brain? These are huge questions, yeah. right? And we, we hope to be able to study these things. I, I think empirically, I don't know how to think about them. I don't know how to theorize on this. So those are really interesting questions. Right, right. So I, I got one more question, uh, but I think it's pretty, uh, maybe it's an outrageous thought, but like, uh, so uh, so uh, is, is it possible to have an, uh, have an optical, optical analog of this, 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 this network? Like, uh, um, we thought about that a little bit, and some people have different thoughts than, than me, but I think not. Because I, I think what you need to get the couple learning to work is an energy functional. You have to have something that, that either dissipates energy or stores energy. There ha energy has to be involved somehow. Yeah, Other, you know, so that the clamped can be greater than the free. 
right? With, 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 with photonics, of course, you know, the, the, the speed of signal propagation will be even greater, but where's the energy? Right, right. Thank you so much. So this is related to uh, the question that Sayantan asked, the time take, uh, taken to uh, basically learn. And as your network become bigger and bigger, you have uh, even more complex uh, landscape with many more minima. And is, is there some systematic thing that you checked? Uh, how long does it take as a function of size of the yeah. network? So that's a great question. So the, the, time learn, the, time, the time required to learn. So the digital case, there's 128 resistance values. And we always learned you know, between 50 and 100 uh, clicks. Mm -hmm. okay? So that kind of made sense. Uh, but there's, the networks are too small to systematically study that effect. Even with the analog case of, you know, five by five lattice, it's still too small. Mm -hmm. Simulations. So, so Andrea's team have looked at this question a little bit, and uh, Andrea might want to say more. But, um, but, but the result that seems to be coming out is that, by contrast, with artificial neural networks, where the training time is linear in system size, mm -hmm. here. The train time seems to be system size to the 0.2 power. No, this uh, I asked because uh, in, in the disordered system, one can also do oscillatories here and uh, have this uh, code memory. And uh, if you're familiar with that literature. Uh, I, I don't quite. So, uh, so if you take uh, amorphous solids and do oscillatories here, then in, in an AQS setup, then you reach uh, absorbing states. Oh, yes. Okay. And there you can actually yeah. code memory, but depending on right. how you train. And uh, some of our recent results seems to suggest that if you make that uh, material or, or the, the sample bigger and bigger, then the time uh, taken to reach to that uh, steady state uh, grows power with the power law, uh, with system size. Yeah. And an exponent which is uh, which depends on a little bit on the amplitude of training, but, uh, but that, uh, this is the reason why I'm asking. Yep. So at yep. uh, very large network, it will be impossible to learn. That's right. So for us, the scaling with system size seems to be advan advantageous. Yeah. 0 0.2 power compared to the to power power one. Power one. Yeah. I mean, people are so enamored of backpropagation because, well, you know, if you're inverting a matrix, you would think it would, you know, mm. basically, you know, increase. It'd be pretty onerous. But backpropagation makes it linear in system size. Oh. And people are happy about that. But we can do better than. Better. Our scaling is more is better than backpropagation. Yeah. No. Thank you. But I Sorry, push. I don't know who's. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so so uh, that the networks that you have trained. So uh, I was thinking that uh, the each node have on average same number of links, but let's say if you have a network that is like scale free network, uh, then would it help to uh, help the network to train faster? It could. We haven't been able to build big enough networks to make them scale free, these hierarchical kinds of networks. Nature does that. Yes. We, we, we make networks that are hierarchical all the time too, right? So hierarchies are important. That architecture is important for getting information to propagate across the system. So we think we have systematic ways of, of, of of, of implementing that, so we're going to try to study. Okay. I think it's an important question. Just, just a quick comment on that, because if, from from what Mark tells us, there's a limit in microfabrication to how many, how large the connectivity can get, and it's about twenty. So per node, so you can't get much above twenty without running into serious problems with microfabrication. So you can't get that large. You can't get like the brain, you know. Okay. We know why, because of spatial dimensionality. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, have, uh, I'll ask two questions if you'll allow me. So the first one is, can these uh, small circuits be used in a modular fashion? For example, you have one s small network that can do an XOR, and suppose you train another to do an AND gate and stuff. And can you combine them to do any, like during com computation and then? Then you'll have a network computer in front of I haven't really thought about that, but I don't see why not. Maybe the non-linearities would not allow them to be combined in a... I don't, I don't see why not, right? I mean, these things are metamaterials. You ought to be able to, 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 to put them together and pull them apart and, you know, 
mash them around like clay. <laughs> it but, should it should be fine. But the problem with like scaling up these analog systems, the, the fact that we don't have any analog computers is because they don't scale up nicely. The errors pile up because because of these non-linearities. And if you're using bits and stuff, you can use like error correcting codes, which will not work here. I mean, I guess. Yeah. I, okay. So that this is this is an interesting point to think about, and that, that we also need to think more about is is uh, we've got a noise floor and it's analog. Uh, where is that going to get us? What, what what are the limitations that it imposes? Um, and also, what does this say about the arena of applicability? Like, you know, are we going to compete with artificial neural networks, or are we going to ultimately uh, find niche applications? And analog versus digital is going to play into that, into the answer to that question. I'm sure of it. Um, you know, uh, people were talking about how, uh, about time scales as a function of the size of the network. But I thought, it's, isn't it important to ask about time scales as, a, as the size of some objective measure of complexity of the task? I mean, uh, and I, I, do you have any thoughts on that in your case? I mean, well, no. Only that I've seen it. <laughs> so in the case of training Alistair, wham, yeah. it can come to equilibrium very quickly. But where it has to find the right kind of nonlinearity to do XOR, for example, the system kind of wanders around in the dark mm -hmm. for a while before it figures out where is the nonlinearity it can take advantage of. I see. And I see. And if you make small random changes, do you find that that time can change a lot so that it's like the favorable event takes not quite the same time in each case if you've done introduced some random change, you know, like like in nucleation or something yeah. horrible like that. So, you know, node selection and you know, all these things they 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 play a role, but I we haven't really figured figured out anything systematic. Right. Okay. Um, so on the topic of how to choose the number of edges you need to learn a particular task, um, I know in kind of recent uh, artificial neural networks, there's a lot of techniques of adding regularizations to the cost function, similar to the one you mentioned about power. Yeah, I think I think uh, so. Effectively, sometimes the resistance will will just go off, you know, just just go through the roof, right? The edge is trying to take it's trying to take out that edge. I guess is there like a sorry if I can follow up um, like a more systematic way to say. It? Oh. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's a way to think about what's going on when it, in, the, in the first generation when it drifted. And some resistors would go up to the rail. And that left other ones that carried the, the, the burden of, of really doing the task. You know, so how many went to the rail and how many didn't? Right? That would be a way of answering. That, that would, I think, bear on your, your question and suggestion. Uh, we, we haven't looked at that. The cost function landscape, it might have several minima. And uh, wh while you are evolving the uh, conductivities, it might get stuck in one of the minimas. So why don't you use some like uh, random noise to, like uh, in your equations? So analog is bad, analog is good. <laughs> uh, in fact, the the, uh, the the case I showed you where Jacob made the um, the the asynchronous learning does exactly that. It's it's really what it's doing. It's adding some noise to the system that help that's helping it find a slightly better uh, solution to the problem. Um. So in your uh, network, you basically had an input that was fixed, and you wanted a desired output, and it did the learning process. Once you take this trained and trained network now, and now you give it a fuzzy input, uh, does it fall into the same uh, because it's in some sort of a landscape? Does it roll into that output, or 
or what does it do? Uh, um, I mean, it's still just a network of, of components and it'll give you an output value. And it's up to you to, to look at the answer. Like we could feed it nonsense after we did classification and the, the, three, the three, three output voltage values would be kind of funky, right? So I, there would be clues there that, that, that they're sort of nonsense. I think, I think. Okay, so Doug and Andrea haven't given the right advertisement for this. Here's the reason why all of you should be excited about it. A, almost every branch of physics, when you're in the middle of your, delivering your talk, there is some crazy Russian physicist who will stand up and say, Already published, 1938, Dokladi Ekad, now SSSR. This is one area where they can't do that. <laughs> Look for those areas. <laughs> All right, thank you.